Good morning, again, uh, for those of you who are joining, who are not able to join or are joining the second session, please welcome. Our second session is on the topic, women and gender in the Middle East. I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Najee Al-Ali, is the Director of Middle East Studies, Robert Family Professor of International Studies, Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies, Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, Brown University at Providence, Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Her main research interests revolve around feminist activism and gendered mobilization, women and war in the Middle East, transnational perspectives, Iraqi women untold stories from 1948 to present, and secularism, gender, and the state in the Middle East. In addition to teaching a course on gender and sexuality in the Middle East, Professor Al-Ali also serves on the advisory board of COAL, a journal of body and gender research, and has been involved in feminist organizations and campaign transnationality. By way of education, she has a PhD from London, MA, American University in Cairo, BA, University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Al-Ali. Thank you very much, uh, Raj, and good morning, everyone. Please take, take it over. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So uh, I am going to now share my screen. Um, let me just see. Okay, so... Um, what I'm going to do um, today, let me just see. Okay, um, so the overview of what I want to do today, and I should say that I will share the slides with you, uh, so you will be able to look at the words. So the um, presentation has images and it also has keywords. I will share a presentation that just consists of the words um, with Raj and Carl, and I'm happy for this to be distributed so you don't have to take uh, notes of the keywords. Obviously, you can take notes of what I say. Um, so basically, I want to start out by just sort of problematizing the Middle East. Maybe some someone has done that earlier, but I thought I will do that. I tend to do that when I teach it. Um, I say a few words about the shift from women to gender studies. Um, Anyone who is dealing with the teaching of women and gender in the Middle East has to work through the many layers of representations and stereotypes that exist out in the public domain. Um, I'll, I will um, spend a few minutes talking about Islam and patriarchy and how that frames the discussion, introduce the significance of the state and political economy, um, address the issue of gender-based violence, which is, of course, a very um, prevailing issue when it comes to women and gender in the Middle East. Talk about feminist mobilizations and resistance. Introduce um, recent literature and thinking around men and masculinities, as well as um, say a few words about sexuality and queer studies. Okay, so um, now when you actually um, look at maps of the Middle East, and I did this exercise actually uh, years ago, you find that, uh, you know, there are very different kinds of designations. And I just wanted to share with you a few of those to give you an idea that although we use the term, um, actually different people might mean different things. So, um, I mean, in one book I found, you know, this, I mean, this is quite an, was quite an old book. Um, then, of course, there's a question, you know, does the Middle East contain North Africa or not? Um, so, you know, I just thought, you know, this is an interesting exercise to see how really in different maps and different conceptions and at different historical moments, the Middle East was conceived of quite differently. Um, I mean, aside from the fact that um, it's not quite clear, you know, do we count, let's say, is Afghanistan part of the wider Middle East or not? Is North Africa part of the wider Middle East? 
There's also, of course, a, an issue around designation. I mean, the Middle East, middle to what and east to what? It is clearly a term that was coined in Western context. And, you know, there are some people, some colleagues who prefer the term West Asia, West Asia and North Africa. However, I, I personally do use the term Middle East largely because most people in the region are actually using it. I mean, in Arabic, al shaq al awsat refers to the Middle East. So, you know, I would, you know, if I would speak about it or I would write about it, I would footnote the fact that it's a contested term and that, you know, if I say the Middle East, I actually mean the MENA region, so the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so I think it's good to spend, if you teach anything around the Middle East, to spend some time just kind of problematizing the term and recognizing that it's a contested term. I don't um, use West Asia, but there's some people who do it. I, you know, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. Oh, yeah, see, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's even some more. Um, okay, now, um, moving on from the Middle East, <clears throat> just a few words about the shift from women to gender studies. So um, the women's studies emerged, as you probably know, in parallel or in the context of second wave uh, feminist mobilization, particularly in the US, but also in other parts of the world. And so women's studies initially was very much about inserting women's experiences into the story. So whether it is in terms of history, whether in terms of literature, art, the social sciences more broadly, um, the idea that, you know, for a long time, women's experiences were either more marginalized or subsumed under uh, human, and human was often actually a focus on men. Um, now, as part of you know this development we also find that in in middle east studies there was an emergence of uh, literature on women in the middle east um, in the 70s and also in the 80s and that literature i would say very much reacted to pre-existing stereotypes about women's oppression a lack of agency in the Middle East, because what happened prior to that is that we often had um, male researchers study communities. I'm, you know, from an anthropological point of view, you know, they would go to communities and they would ask about women. And as you know, because there were male researchers, they didn't actually have access to women's world. So they would ask the men about the women. And of course, then they would get a very sort of skewed idea about it. And so that literature that followed this in the 70s and 80s was very much about challenging these depictions of um, you know oppressed women and so there was lots of focus on agency and power um, and this tension between structure and agency you know the structure I mean you know what are the prevailing structures of inequality injustice oppression that constrain women's lives as opposed to, you know, what are forms of agency and resistance, that kind of tension, I think, is something that we see run through as a threat through until today. Now, then there was a shift to um, women, which were often essentialized, and, you know, the idea that, you know, the recognition that, well, women don't just exist in the singular and you know sisterhood is not necessarily global because women are also you know of a particular social class they're of a particular ethnicity they're of a uh, particular religious group and in the middle east of course you know ethnic minorities religious minorities these kind of inequalities very much shaped um, a woman's existence and her access to resources her access to rights and so on so in parallel to the way that we, um, I mean, in, in Western context, there was a shift from women to gender studies. We also see that in the context of the Middle East, within the Middle East, as well as the scholarship on the Middle East, more emphasis on gender. Here, you know, not just women, what does it mean to be an ideal woman? What are prevailing gender norms in any place at any given time? What are the prevailing gender relations? 
how does power come into play? Uh, what does it mean to be an ideal woman? But also what does it mean to be an ideal man? Um, so that was became much more predominant in terms of the, the literature and increasing interest in men and masculinities. Although I should say that until recently, when we speak about gender in the Middle East or the scholarship on gender in the Middle East, I would say that 90% has been on women. Um, but I think now there, there's more and more sort of interest in men and masculinities and, you know, that we also really have to rethink uh, and be much more nuanced when we think about men and masculinities. Um, and also, of course, the other issue that has increasingly come into place that of sexuality and challenging heteronormativity. Um, in, intersectionality, which of course, <clears throat> in the context of the US, so I mean, you see, I have all these uh, keywords, mm, so I will share those with you. Um, in the context of the US, when you think intersectionality, of course, you immediately think gender, race, class. But when you think intersectionality in the context of the Middle East, it's not necessarily race that is the issue, but for instance, in Iraq, um, sectarian identity. So, you know, if someone is Sunni versus Shia would play an important role, you know, because there are certain power relations, unequal power relations linked to that, or in some countries, ethnicity. So when I think about Iraq, you know, being a Kurd, being ethnic minority would be an important element of intersectional power relations. Um, as I said, more recently, we have um, queer approaches to the Middle East, and I will say something about that later, but in sort of increasing recognition that sexuality, the control of sexuality, but also heteronormativity are very much key to understanding wider social processes uh, within the region. Um, so, as I said, I mean, historically, um, gender in the Middle East has been very much understood in terms of women, women's status, um, ideologies um, pertaining to women. Um, and when it comes to men, the traditional focus has been on religious networks, militarization, war, conflict, um, but also labor movements. Um, so the, the interest in the study of masculinities um, is very much linked also to a recognition that men, just like women, have been um, subject to stereotypes within Western discourse. And I would say not so much within Western scholarship, but within Western media and also policy discourse. Okay, so some trigger warnings. I'm going to show you some images of nudity here uh, because I you know, want to say something about the history of representation and stereotypes around the Middle East. And the history, of course, goes all the way back to you know, 18th century, 19th century, Orientalist paintings, and you know this is the you know uh, French uh, French painters imagining the Orient, and you know at, at the time the images that um, were produced through paintings were images of um, you know harems, belly dancing girls, lots of nudity, very erotic, very exotic, um, and paintings were soon. Um, I mean, so this is the one side of the equation in terms of Orientalist representation, you know, sort of this idea of the exotic, erotic Orient. But more recently, the other side of the equation is, of course, the oppressed woman, right? And this um, image is an image that, um, you know, I, I actually often uh, hesitate to show because I just know that an image like that right feeds into pre-existing stereotype about oppressed Muslim women in the Middle East. This is actually a picture that was taken in the south of Iraq during a religious festival. And I have to say, I showed this picture to, um, you know, several Iraqi women who were arguing with me and said, no, this is not Iraq. We've never seen anything like that. 
So many Iraqis do not recognize this as part of their reality. But of course, what happens if a picture like that of a religious extremist group, which is a small group in the south of Iraq, on a specific holiday, if that image comes out into the Western media, then that image is being equated with Iraqi women. I mean, that's how, you know, things have been, that has been part of the mechanism of producing certain cliches and stereotypes. Um, so I, I think it's important to stress that, um, so the relation between representations and realities. I mean, for the most part, um, pictures we see about the Middle East are not staged pictures, although we did have, I don't know, do I have this? Yeah, this is actually a picture of a French photographer uh, during, um, you know, French, French colonial period in Algeria. And um, French photographers would go to Algeria with precisely those images in mind that I showed you, this Orientalist painting of these, you know, naked women in the harem, in the bath. And then they would go and they, would, I, they wouldn't see any of this. And so they were so frustrated. What they did is they paid women to stage, to pose in studios. And they, you know, I mean, these I actually chose now pictures that are not, you know, sort of as explicit, but, you know, some of these pictures are quite, I mean, also, you know, sexualized and, you know, women half naked. And then these pictures would be sent as postcards to France and presented as reality, right? So now most pictures that circulate are not of the sort that they are staged. I mean, these are pictures that are taken in reality, but the problem is that they are only a segment of a very complex and much more diverse reality, but they're being presented to us in the Western media and Western policy discourse as the full reality, right? Um, so, you know, I think that is really important to, you know, think about, you know, images and how they travel and how do we interpret uh, images um, presenting not necessarily untruths, but maybe partial truths, so only you no know, segments of truth. Uh, but also often, you know, the kind of discourses, the kind of stories that are being told around images distort, you know, the much more complex reality. And uh, what I think is also really important to stress is that um, women and gender are actually central two constructions of difference. And that's not something that's unique to the Middle East, but when you think about any communities, um, you know, whether it's between two countries or if it's between ethnic or religious communities, where there is conflict in con situations of acute war or, you know, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, women are often used as boundaries between us versus them. Our women are proper, our, your women are uh, loose, have no morals, or our women are liberated, your women are oppressed. I mean, that's a very powerful trope. And that trope, of course, has been very central to the way that um, the Middle East and the Muslim world more broadly has been constructed as the barbaric other. Um, and also interestingly is, you know, that shifting representations of women and gender actually reflect shifting political uh, realities. So what do I mean here? You know, if you, there are some people who have actually have traced representations of Iranian women. And you see that depending on the specific political context, whether it is sort of a more liberal context or let's say more friendly relations between the US and Iran or whether things are more tense, you see that women actually are presented either, you know, in much more colorful ways or uh, you see, you know, much more sort of stringent images of women's representation. Um, and so um, Orientalism um, is uh, an ongoing way in which the Middle East is represented. And here, of course, I'm thinking of the late 
um, Edward Said, who in 1978 wrote a book by the name of Orientalism. And in that book, he looked at 19th and early 20th um, century a scholarship, um, maybe Brit mainly British, um, but also to some extent French and a bit of German scholarship on the Middle East mainly. And, you know, he argued that the knowledge production about the Middle East actually revealed more about the countries that are producing knowledge than the Middle East itself. So, you know, this was like stories of uh, superiority, um, very much justifying the colonial project, depicting um, the culture within the Middle East as inferior, as barbaric, a focus on Islam, explaining everything in relation to Islam. Um, I mean, I'm happy to elaborate more in the Q&A, but so this, this idea of Orientalism or the critique of Orientalism has been very powerful and has been an important intervention, not only in relation to knowledge production about the Middle East, but any kind of area studies and the recognition that you know, knowledge production about an area is often very much linked to power inequalities and often reflecting ideas of superiority as opposed to really reflecting local complex diversities and realities. So uh, this is another image in terms of representation that's kind of the counter to the earlier image I showed you of the women that were totally veiled. And these are, of course, Kurdish women who have been fighting ISIS. And we saw, you know, a few years ago, 2014, 2015, 16, when ISIS, after ISIS emerged in the region, and it was mainly Kurds and uh, amongst them, predominantly Kurdish women who were fighting ISIS. You had the depictions of these, you know, the almost Amazonian, beautiful, uh, strong, you know, women fighting ISIS. Um, so, you know, there were kind of all the magazines and the media was full of them. And, you know, again, I mean, it's not, this is not a misrepresentation. I mean, women were fighting. I mean, some of the discourse, some of the story around it was problematic in the way that these women were sexu sexualized and glorified like, you know, Amazonian fighters. But it was also interesting that no one really paid attention to the question, so how did women get there? You know, that's like, okay, so these are these fighters. But at the same time, the very ideology that actually contributed to them being fighters, which is, you know, most of them were influenced by the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, and that is actually an organization that is being criminalized as a terrorist organization. And so there was a kind of mismatch between, on the one hand, the glorification of these um, female fighters, Kurdish fighters, and then the, you know, the underlying actually political realities that they're part of a group that is criminalized and so i mean and people didn't really ask questions around that okay, i showed you that um okay so now if uh this works i will share i want to share like a brief video it's about i think eight minutes or so um which introduces the idea of orientalism and i think it's a really good teaching tool um and i, I it's part of the um you know, the resources I, I linked, but I thought, you know, just for this session, I think it would be good to actually share that with you. So I hope it works. These is red bottoms. These is bloody shoes. Yeah, I butchered that. You've probably heard Cardi B's hit song, Bodak Yellow. And like basically everyone else, I couldn't get enough of it. That is until Cardi B released the music video. These is fancy. These is red bottoms. These is bloody shoes. Did y'all see that? Why is she wearing a hijab with a veil over her? in the middle of the desert. Bodak Yellow shows how music, television, and film still paint Arabs and Muslims in a highly exoticized light. And it's just one example of how Orientalism is pretty much everywhere in our pop culture. Think of Aladdin, think of Homeland, or Sasha Baron Cohen's entire career. I made that up. Hi guys, I'm Omar, and this Sunday on AJ Plus, we're breaking down the concept of Orientalism. 
where it comes from, and why it's a problem. And just know, I'm definitely going to ruin some of your childhood favorites. <laughs> And now I'm about to drop a whole new world of knowledge on you. Aladdin was one of the most Orientalist films of all time. And Professor Walter Denny, who's taught Orientalist art for decades, agrees. Like those first three or four minutes of the Disney movie Aladdin are basically very prejudicial. They create a very, very false and very, very prejudicial view of the Islamic world. Before I upset you anymore, let me tell you why it's so bad by explaining what Orientalism is. Historically, Orientalism refers to the study of the Arab and Muslim world, or what was for a long time referred to as the Orient, which included more than just Arab or predominant Muslim societies. And the discipline basically looked at those societies as though they were interchangeable, inferior, and well, mystical and savage. Just the fact we say there's an Arab or Muslim world is proof of how pervasive that way of thinking was and is. But now, Will Yeomans, a professor of media studies and public affairs, says the definition has evolved. It's become to mean something else. A critique, actually, of a particular way of knowing about that part of the world. The late Palestinian American professor, author, and activist Edward Said wrote the book on Orientalism, making his Palestinian Arab identity central to his work. Fanaticism, violence, etc., always associated with the Arabs, with Islam, and so on and so forth. Arabs are always being killed. They're always associated publicly in the, in the public mind, in the public image, with what is negative uh, and, and, and regressive. He called his book Orientalism, and it forever changed the way we think of Western depictions of the Arab and Muslim world. Said also said Orientalism relies on letting Westerners interact with the Orient without ever losing the upper hand. Basically, it's about power. And his criticism was that the study of it, the scholarship about the Middle East and the Near East and South Asia, uh, was really based on a lens of empire. Said also said Orientalism presented imagery of a mysterious land full of secrets, monsters, and sensual women. But the depictions weren't just about exotification. Orientalist art and literature often served a more sinister purpose. One of the most important ideas behind Orientalist art has been to show the Islamic world in a position of either moral or cultural inferiority to that of the West. And according to Said, that desire to show Arabs and Muslims as morally less than had a very real impact on the everyday lives of people living in the so-called Orient regardless of their ethnicity or religion. It doesn't just affect Arabs and Muslims, it can also affect Black Africans, Indians, and other Asians. Said's work dissected what media characterizations of Arabs and Muslims in Western news outlets looked like during and after Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution. It is from the mosques that opposition to the Shah is being led by puritanical Shiite Muslims. The religious zealots want to return to the constitution of 1906. The concept of Orientalism isn't just that there are issues with this painting or that novel. It's that this painting or that novel both create and perpetuate inaccurate portrayals of Muslims and Arabs. It dehumanizes anyone who falls into those groups and supports dangerous policies. And these stereotypes bring me back to Aladdin. The late Arab-American academic Jack Shaheen identified the Orientalist themes and tropes in Aladdin. After its 1992 debut, Shaheen campaigned to make Disney alter the opening song, Arabian Nights. And you probably don't remember this line. Seriously, he just referred to a made-up Arab land as barbaric and put it to a children's beat. Shaheen responded in the LA Times and he said it was a painful reminder to 3 million Americans of Arab heritage as well as 300 million Arabs and others that the abhorrent Arab stereotype is as ubiquitous as Aladdin's land. You might not be able to say that it's racist, but you can say it's a misrepresentation of cultures and it's a blending of cultures all to serve the purpose of sort of this mainstream American entertainment. Shaheen also said these pictures would impact an audience's understanding of the Arab world and have a real world impact with the negative portrayal of Agraba serving as what he called Hollywood's fabricated Arab world. Well, he may be right. In 2015, as the U.S. bombed ISIS in Iraq and Syria, a poll found that 30% of Republican voters would support bombing Agrabah. And before you agree, Agrabah is the fictional country in Aladdin 
it's not real. Other activist groups criticized the film's character portrayal with Aladdin and Jasmine having anglicized features and American accents. You're not free to make your own choices. Sometimes you feel so... You're just... trapped. And the rest have really fake Arabic accents and far less attractive physical features. I had to slit a few throats, but I got it. But Aladdin is not the only film in recent memory to use Orientalist imagery. There's also Prince of Persia, Gods of Egypt, 300, Munich, Zero Dark Thirty, and American Sniper. But that didn't stop some of those from winning Academy Awards. You might say Aladdin is old news. Why bring it up at all? Well, it's coming back as a live action feature and it doesn't seem like much has changed at all. The movie's already been accused of whitewashing the story with the creation of white characters like Prince Anders. If you're gonna spend a lot of money on it, you can't really do anything real. It has to be imaginative. It has to play the fantasy. It therefore has to rely on stereotypes. Oriental imagery has also managed to creep onto the small screen. Television shows like Homeland and 24 are among the biggest culprits with Arabs and Muslims often portrayed as terrorists or violent individuals hell-bent on destroying the United States and or Western civilization. <laughs> Homeland in particular frames Muslims as people you could never trust under any circumstances, even if they were your neighbor. But the terrorist trope is an old one. The most sustaining sort of oriental stereotype is that of the terrorist. You can see that hev heavily present in 1970s, 1980s, both literature and, um, and film. And today we see that that has become still a dominant trope. The Brave is NBC's latest military drama, where good versus evil clash, and the evil happens to be Muslims. But there also happens to be one good Muslim working with the good guys. In many ways, you could say that Hollywood and uh, mainstream uh, movies have become a lot more self-aware about this kind of thing. And so they try to change it up or add a little more complexity, for example, by adding in a Muslim good character as a way to sort of balance out a Muslim villain. And then there are music videos where Orientalist images have been pervasive for a long time. But it's not as discussed as it is in other art forms. Which brings us back to Bodak Yellow's music video, where Cardi B shows up in Dubai, so mysterious, so rich, dresses up in Arab garb, so sensual, so exotic, has a fat cheetah, which is dangerous, rides a camel across the desert, aka every Arab's backyard apparently. Okay, so maybe Cardi has never even read Edward Said and may not even know what we're talking about, but in her defense, She's not the only one doing it. There are plenty of other examples of musicians using Oriental's images in today's music videos. I see it as a form of sort of silencing. It's a form of erasure of a culture. It's oversimplification. And people have a right to be insulted by that. And they have a right to protest it and demand uh, that they be treated with a little more respect. So what will it take to ensure that we stop exoticizing Arabs and Muslims in our movies, TV shows, and favorite music videos? Love you, Cardi B. Growing up, whenever I watched Aladdin, I was somehow able to separate between that portrayal of Arabs and my own Arab family. Have you guys seen this sort of exoticized imagery for other communities or in TV shows, cartoons, films? Let us know. Let us also know what you think and come back next Sunday for another great video. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. These is... Okay, so... Um... The reason I shared the video is um, because I, you know, when I think through how to teach about uh, the Middle East more generally, but specifically about women and gender, <clears throat> in my experience, I find that, you know, there's only so much that you can convey through words, but I think images and videos actually play a very important tool in terms of teaching and I mean I think you probably noticed yourself I mean I introduced for those of you who didn't know about orientalism before you know I introduced the concept but sharing this video I think you get a very different kind of idea because it becomes much more tangible and visually also you know it's, it's understood so I think that personally I think that using visual material when teaching uh, is really important 
Um, of course, as a woman and gender studies scholar, um, I mean, I noticed that it's all men speaking, and I would use that also as a way into, you know, the um, knowledge production and that that is still often very much controlled or dominated by men. But also, while, while I think that the video um, does a really good job in introducing the idea of Orientalism more broadly, it is gender blind because it does not speak about the centrality of women and sexuality in constructing this difference between the East and the West. Um, so I now want to move on to uh, speak about, uh, you know, this idea that um, is often, you know, when we speak about the Middle East and we speak about women and gender, of course, everyone wants to speak about Islam and women and the veil. Uh, and here we find that one of the problems um, is that there's this conflation of the predominant religion. And I think it's really important to not equate the Middle East with Islam. It's a Muslim majority region, um, but there are many other religions as well existent in, in the Middle East. Uh, but often there is a conflation between the prevailing <clears throat> or predominant religion, Islam, and culture. Um, and um, people, and of course, that is linked to patriarchy, so that it's a patriarchal culture. Uh, sometimes people, you know, speak about tribal culture. Um, another important sort of characteristic that's often sort of put on the Middle East is heteronormativity. Uh, and what I mean, I'm going to sort of try to unpackage that, but I think that anyone who's teaching on women and gender in the Middle East will be confronted with these pre-existing notions. So you don't teach, I mean, as you know, I guess there's some subjects when you teach, you start from a kind of tabula rasa. I mean, people don't have pre-existing notions about the specific subject, but when it comes to women and gender in the Middle East, I can promise you that every single student in class will have certain ideas. Um, and I guess then it depends, you know, what kind of students in which kind of context. Um, now, when it comes to the role of Islam, um, there are two main strands that you should be aware of. One is the strand that states that argues that Islam is responsible for the oppression of women, and that's often put in a very generalized way. And then there's the other strand that says um, Islam has granted women all necessary rights. Okay, so here the argument would go, it's not religion that is to be blamed, but it is the specific interpretations of Islam. And it's, of course, conservative men who historically have had the power to interpret Islam and also to implement certain practices. Right. So, but that is kind of within um, not just the scholarship, but also, you know, like within Muslim majority countries amongst women that this would be, and men as well, this would be two kind of opposite um, positions. Um, so I, I want to introduce uh, very quickly a book that um, was an important intervention at the time. So this is, um, I think in the late 80s, uh, Leila Ahmed, who is at Harvard, who wrote a book on women and gender in Islam. And um, she was the first who <clears throat> really systematically tried to challenge this idea of, um, you know, Islam being this uniform religion that is oppressing women. And she tried to show the historical changes in terms of Islamic discourses on women and this, and also the changes in terms of practices um, and that they differed over time. And she showed that, you know, Islam actually cannot, should not be seen as, you know, one uniform religious and ideological framework, but it needs to be seen in historical and empirical context. And also what the book did, it showed that at any given time, there were actually debates within Muslim societies, contestations around women's issues. And um, so she asked the important question, and I think that is also an important question to ask when teaching, is how is gender articulated institutionally and, and verbally? 
what are some of the the varying um you know social uh socioeconomic and political contexts that might explain differing gender norms and relations in different places um, and her book also very much um, focused on the impact of colonialism and actually argued that colonialism colonialism is to be blamed for some of the more negative uh, interpretations and practices and laws and that, that these were actually implemented by the British or French in the region and they're not inherently Islamic but they've been imposed from outside. Um, the book you know became a classic and you know anyone sort of teaching on women and gender in the Middle East would have at least part of the book um, on the reading list. The book is also really problematic and you know as so many so many texts, you know, written at a certain time. I mean, in hindsight and now, you know, we are much more critical and nuanced. I mean, um, Laila Ahmed is kind of jumping from one from one period to another. I mean, she's really not a historian uh, specialized in this. So, you know, she's providing an argument, an important argument. There are blind spots. She's also quite essentializing in terms of um, the kind of dichotomous approach, a binary between secular and religious feminist movements, which um, many of us think in reality were much more complex and a longer continuum. But it's a good way to start challenging this idea that there is one uniform Islam that is responsible for women's oppression or for women's rights, depending on your specific viewpoint. <clears throat> um, another author and argument I'd like to introduce to you is um, Denise Kandyoti. So Laila Ahmed is originally Egyptian, but she's lived in the US for a long time. Denise Kandyoti is originally Turkish and she's lived in the UK for a long time. And Denise Kandyoti published in 1988 an article called Bargaining with Patriarchy. Um, which became a classic as well. And she's actually uh, written several iterations of this article and criticizing her own argument. Um, but, you know, questions that she's asked that are really important is, you know, how, how do we account for the variations in women's roles and different forms of male dominance over women in Middle Eastern context? How do we give way to Islam, culture, and socioeconomic processes? And, you know, her her kind of approach was we need to pay attention to political economy. We can't just understand lived realities on the level of culture and religion, but we need to look at the level of, um, you know, political system, uh, economic system, access to resources um, to actually account for differences. Um, other questions uh, that she uh, asked us um, that we should avoid, that we should ask to avoid certain pitfalls are, you know, how have tradition, patriarchy and Islam intersected in producing the conditions for women's subordination or for women's resistance? And how have women been resisting structural inequalities and shaping gender roles? How do women negotiate or bargain with patriarchy and how do they creatively reformulate and subvert traditional and modern practices? Um, and here, you know, very importantly, sort of this, this idea of the patriarchal bargain, which like generations and generations of scholars and students have used. And, you know, the argument here being that, um, most women don't have the power and the resources to actually challenge patriarchy. And what I mean by patriarchy is the rule of male elders. And we have forms of patriarchy everywhere in the world, not just in the Middle East. It's just sort of different degrees. And she said, you know, most women don't have the power. They don't have the resources to challenge the system. But what they do in order to optimize the living conditions is to work with the system, trying to bargain with the system. And, you know, she uses the example of the, the bad mother-in-law, which, you know, is in many ways a stereotypes, but she's using that in the context of a traditional um, 
you know, patrilineal household where you would have some, like three generations living in a household and, you know, um, a young woman who would marry into that family would be at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, if that woman were to give birth to children and particularly if she were to give uh, birth to sons, you know, her prestige would um, rise in that context and she would increase in in power and access to resources and later on if she herself you know becomes a mother and i mean not becomes a mother becomes a mother-in-law if one of her sons gets married i mean what denise candiotti is arguing that often then she reproduces this this cycle of you know treating uh the the young woman who is entering the family um, you know, badly and sort of showing that she has the power. I mean, this is, of course, a cliche. It's a generalization. But I think we do recognize, I think everywhere we can sort of recognize that there is something about this sort of bargaining with the system as opposed to trying to, to challenge it. Um, the other thing that Denise Candiotti and, um, you know, other scholars did um, sort of, this is, I'm speaking now in the 80s and 90s, they started to introduce the significance of the state. If we want to understand um, women, the condition of women, the status of women, if we want to understand prevailing gender norms and relations, we have to pay attention to, to states. I mean, I guess these days we would also use the term governance, you know, what are the specific political systems? Um, so we need to look at specific historical uh, transformations, um, the way that um, you know economic systems also influence gender relations. So you know one example. So from my own work, um, the Ba'athist state. So this is the state in Iraq from 1968 until the invasion of Iraq in 2003. You had one political party. You had one political system. Uh, same culture, same religion, but. Um, there were drastic changes in terms of gender norms and relations. I mean, in the 1970s, after the oil crisis and when oil, oil crisis and when oil prices shot up and the Iraqi economy was booming and labor was needed, the Iraqi state very much emphasized that the good Iraqi woman was the, the educated working woman who was working alongside men. And this was, you know, in the context where definitely uh, the state needed labor. So um, education was made free, uh, childcare was free, women were sent to university, even to study abroad. Um, but this changed quite drastically in the 80s during the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 88. Um, we have the same country, same culture, same religion, but now the discourse shifted from the good Iraqi woman being the educated working woman to the good Iraqi woman being the mother of the future soldiers. And in sometimes in the 80s, Saddam Hussein came out and said, you know, every uh, good Iraqi woman should have five children. So, you know, this is in the context of a war effort where Iran demographically is much more, is much larger than, than Iraq. So in fact, Iraqi women had to become super women because during the war effort, there were even more into in the labor force, there were more, um, filling jobs. So I actually visited my relatives in Iraq in 1985 and I saw women truck drivers and women uh, working at petrol stations. I mean, I grew up in Germany and I'd never seen a woman truck driver and a woman working at a petrol station. But while women were out there in the labor force, they still, you know, had to, um, there was all this pressure for them to produce five children. And it wasn't just this course. I mean, contraception was made illegal, abortion was made illegal, there was very sort of gener generous maternity benefits. And then we moved to the 90s following the in, um, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in, on the 2nd of August 1990, and a few days later the UN imposed um, this uh, very, very uh, quite drastic economic sanctions regime on Iraq, so that was for 13 years until the invasion, and during that time the state lost you know the kind of access to resources and so this was changed so the good Iraqi woman then became the woman who was staying at home with the children this is in a situation where you had um <clears throat> you know very high unemployment and we know this is not just the case in 
Muslim majority context, but when there's high unemployment, there is a kind of shift towards more conservative gender norms and the kind of privileging for men to have the limited jobs that are available. Um, so just to give you an example that, you know, we need to pay attention to political economy and how that might impact a state in changing its outlook on women and gender relations more drastically. I mean, alongside the shift in women's position and the idea that the the ideal woman was constructed, there was of course also shift in terms of the Iraqi men, you know, in, in the 70s, the ideal Iraqi man was also the educated working man, you know, lots of men went outside and, you know, got an education, a PhD or returned or not. Uh, in, uh, you know, the 80s, the good Iraqi man was a fighter, you know, who was defending the country and, uh, yeah, I mean, and in the 90s, it was, you know, ideally the breadwinner who would have a job or make sure that the family would survive in the context of the sanction system. Um, and so, you know, a state, depending on context, a state might challenge existing gender ideologies and relations and might, uh, you know, challenge it uh, in a way that, um, you know, to sort of try to, uh, steer people to more progressive ideas, or it might reproduce it. And that very much depends not just on the kind of regime, but also on the kind of context. Um, now, I um, want to say sort of a few words about um, post-colonial nation building. And, and while well, here is sort of an image of citizenship, I mean, one of the things that has been a big issue in the context of the Middle East and one of the issues that feminists have in the region have mobilized a lot about is that of the issue of citizenship um, and the fact that in many countries, um, women are not able to actually pass on their citizenship to their children. Uh, and this is particularly significant. I'm, I just heard, um, you know, a little bit from the last session, you're talking about Palestine. This, is, this point is particularly significant because you have, of course, a large Palestinian diaspora that lives within the Middle East. Um, and so, you know, Palestinian men who get married to women in Jordan or in Lebanon or in Egypt, uh, then, you know, the women, uh, so the, the Palestinians are basically stateless and the, the women in those countries are not able to pass on citizenship. That has been changing. I mean, that's, you know, because of feminist mobil mobilizing uh, laws have been put in place to try to address it, but in practice, it's still really, really difficult for um, women to pass on their citizenship. Um, just um, wanted to say a little bit about this moment of post-colonial nation building and the relationship between um, nationalism and feminism, because, you know, I think sort of one of the things that um, you know, there's lots of misconception about that, you know, feminism is a Western concept and, you know, should be imposed feminist ideas on the Middle East. But in fact, there's a long history of feminist activism within the Middle East, right, sort of irrespective of the West. And actually, in the context of independence, liberation, anti-colonial struggles at the turn of the 20th century, feminist activism actually emerged in the Middle East. Yeah, so you had like, uh, you know, for instance, I think I have a picture here. Yes, this is a picture of um, the uh, Egyptian women who in, you know, in the very beginning of the 20th century were protesting against the British colonizers. Uh, but actually, they were also uh, protesting for increased rights, right to education, political rights. And actually, in um, Egypt, we had in 1923, uh, the Egyptian Feminist Union was established. And shortly after that, um, in Iraq, you also had a um, feminist organization in Palestine. So, you know, very important to stress that, you know, feminism is not something that emerged uh, within, uh, from outside. It wasn't imposed. Um, while nationalist movements and spaces opened up political spaces for women, there have also always been tensions because historically uh, women have always been told that 
um, you need to, um, oh, let me just go back here first for a moment. Um, we will first have to address the wider issues, you know, let us liberate the country, let us get rid of the colonizers, let us get rid of class oppression, let us get rid of X, Y, and Z, and then we will turn to women's rights and women's equalities. And historically, women have learned the lessons that that never happened automatically, so that even in the context of post-colonial nation building, women were not just given the rights, but they had to fight for them, you know, whether it's the right to vote, whether it's the right to access certain, you know, jobs or education. Um, but so, you know, there's sort of this, I mean, some Western scholars, feminist scholars have argued that feminism and nationalism is antithetical and that nationalism, there's always this kind of focus on certain forms of um, femininities that are very much about controlling women's bodies, women's sexuality, controlling the community, making sure that women do not uh, engage in any relationships outside of the community, um, and that, you know, anything linked to gender-based rights will always be marginalized to the nationalist struggle. But um, other feminists, especially in the context of the Middle East, uh, Palestinian, Algerian, Kurdish um, scholars have argued no, but I mean, there is a strong relationship between the nationalist struggle and the feminist struggle and actually in some, in many ways uh, was closely linked. Um, in the context of post-colonial nation building, and when I say post-colonial nation building, I'm referring to the time following colonialism, so the 50s and 60s and up to the 70s, um, Secularization was also an important process, and so the idea that if you want to modernize society, uh, we have to secularize it. But throughout this period, we have seen a tension um, between more modernizing and conservative trends, as we've seen tensions between more secular and religious trends. But here, I think it's also important to stress that um, I think there's often the perception that anything Islamic is authentic and secular is not authentic. But again, if you look at the history of the Middle East, we actually see that there is a long history of secular constituencies um, trying to make their mark and trying to influence uh, the social and political sphere. Okay. Um, I, okay, so this is a picture of... Um, uh, women in Turkey, and I'm just uh, feel that I should. Okay, yeah, just you know, very quickly, I want to say a few words about the way that nationalism, uh, that women and gender is very central to nationalist discourse, because women are seen to be the biological reproducers of the nation. Um, they are also often seen as a symbolic, symbolic reproducers of the nation. So. Women are the bearers of culture. They're often seen as the mothers of the nation. So uh, women's dress code, women's mobility, their sexuality is often controlled as part of trying to make sure that the nation or a specific community um, is not tainted by outside influences. And um, in some contexts or in many contexts, actually the nation is represented as a female to be protected or to be violated. And, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that, um, I'm sorry to have to say this, but, you know, sexual violence, rape is often used as a weapon of war. And it's not just used uh, as a way to hurt an individual woman, but it's used as a way to hurt an entire community or a nation. Um, so, um, but uh, I am conscious of time and I want to leave half an hour for discussion. So let me just uh, finish by saying a few words about, um, okay, well, no, I want to maybe take, if it's okay, I'll take five minutes. Um, so this image I wanted to share with you um, in terms of ideas around um, education and the significance of education. Um, so this is actually an iconic image of Iraq that was taken in the late seventies. 
Um, and Iraq in the 70s actually won a prize from UNESCO uh, for being the country that managed to raise the literacy rates of girls and women in the most rapid way. And the way Iraq did that, and I should say this is in the context of being a, a dictator, authoritarian dictatorship in the 70s, an authoritarian dictatorship uh, with resources, with money that was also uh, engaging in welfare in terms of providing free education, providing free health care, and providing these enforced literacy programs. So every adult, male and female, between the age of 15 and 65, if they were not able to read or write, had to go through these literacy programs, and they were sort of rolled out across Iraq. And, you know, Iraq partly managed to do it because it was a centralized um, authoritarian state and don't get me wrong I mean I'm in no business of being apologetic of this but you know one of the positive side effects was that actually um, you know women did they, they managed the state managed to increase the literacy rate quite um, drastically because even if there were let's say some conservative men who didn't want their their daughters or their wives to go to school as part of the scheme they had to go they had to let them go and um, yes, oh, this is also a picture, uh, Iraq in the 70s, uh, Mustansaria University, um, <clears throat> which is one of the oldest universities in Iraq. And, and women were very much part of the university system and they would study anything. I mean, they would study engineering and physics as they would study English and medicine or law. Um, and, you know, this is also to sort of complicate sort of this idea of liberating women. And I mean, I have written a book about the impact of the invasion and occupation on women and gender in Iraq and, um, you know, the big gap between this sort of rhetoric of liberating women and then what actually happened, because in many ways, um, you know, there was actually a shift towards much more conservative gender norms and relations following the invasion of Iraq. And also there was an increase of gender-based violence and I think I will um, end my lecture uh, to give some time for questions or comments uh, to just say a few things about gender-based violence, because that, again, is very much at the forefront when people think about the Middle East and women and gender. I mean, gender-based violence immediately comes to mind. And here again, I would say that a lot of the discussion is very much crouched in this sort of orientalist terms of, you know, the poor oppressed women, you know, without any kind of agency. Uh, and then, of course, in the same uh, vein, you know, men being violent or Middle Eastern men being a naturally violent, uh, a culture of violence against women. So that's I mean, I would, uh, you know, in the classroom, that's a trope that I would want to challenge. Um, and I would want to challenge this culturalization of um, gender-based violence and the sort of conflating of culture and religion um, and the focus on Islam. Uh, the focus on Islam, which really takes away from so many other factors. I mean, you would never explain gender-based violence in the United States by reference to the prevailing Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, you would look at other factors. You would look at, um, you know, socioeconomic factors, uh, psychological factors. I mean, you would, there will be lots of issues that you look at, but for some reason, there's sort of this tendency to explain things away with reference to religion, with reference to Islam only. Um, this focus on oppression and victimhood. So, I mean, you know, in my work, I see a clear link between the increased militarization of society in the Iraqi context, militarization which involves a uh, privileging of militarized masculinities, which involves a normalization of violence. And, you know, feminist scholars in many different contexts have shown that there is a direct link between the kind of violence that is happening in an acute warfare situation and um, violence that we see like gender-based violence in, in the home or at the workplace and that is because you know there is this normalization of violence and there's also this privileging of a certain form of militarized masculinity 
So clearly, you know, when we try to explain gender-based violence, this is not to justify it, but um, we need to look at the impact of war and conflict. We need to look at the impact of economic crises. Um, and we need to look at the specific historical context changes, uh, specific historical economies. Now, the dilemma for those of us who are based in a Western context, and I would say, especially those of us who are now, I mean, so I've just moved to the States three years ago from London. And I think, you know, one of the dilemmas that I'm facing and, you know, many of my colleagues is, so we want to resist, we want to challenge the Islamophobic, racist, stereotypical depictions of women and gender within the Middle East, and particularly the way that people here speak about gender-based violence as something natural to those barbaric societies. But um, so, you know, one strategy to do that um, is to, you know, stress the impact of wars, the impact of uh, imperialism. So, you know, in the Iraqi context, I mean, the US-led uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, but also neoliberal, uh, neoliberal um, economics. And, you know, in some, I think some people also um, use Zionist, Zionism as an uh, explanatory framework. Um, but I, from, to my mind, you know, it's important to challenge this idea that there's something in, inherent in Middle Eastern culture or there's something inherent in Islam that accounts for gender-based violence. But I think it is problematic to totally dismiss the idea that there might be cultural, religious, local, national, regional factors that contribute to gender-based violence. And I, you know, I'm particularly aware of that because I'm in contact with feminists and queer activists in the Middle East who sometimes feel undermined by people being based in the US who say, oh, it has nothing to do with local culture and religion. You know, it's all about, you know, Western influence. And I think that is problematic as well. So the trick is really, you know, trying to balance, to recognize that we have to move away from these simplistic orientalist stereotypical representations of women and gender, but um, at the same time, you know, not to be apologetic for oppressive practices. Uh, and I think on that note, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, now leave some space for questions. And I see in the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, good, good, good morning again to you. Thank you very much. You have given a completely different picture of the other side of the story, not only with regard to the Middle East and Islam, but also the stereotyping in the Western popular culture of non-Western societies and the generalization that goes with it, uh, especially as it appeals to the people in terms of uh, mass audience that goes to movies or other things, the Lion King kind of thing mm -hmm. um, that comes here. And I think one of the goals of our uh, program is to help students to overcome stereotypical images. For example, the 10 minutes video link you had is an excellent presentation mm -hmm. that students need to see and, and, and learn from and understand how to overcome stereotypical images. Uh, I don't want to take away too much time but that because our blunt, our break is at 12.15, but uh, rather than the confusion we had last time, those of you who have questions, please quickly raise your hand and uh, ask a couple of questions. We are going to break at 12.15. Uh, and Dr. Ali, Dr. Al Ali, thank you so much for a very insightful and uh, unique presentation. Questions, please. Yeah, I see that there are two questions already in the chat, so I'm happy to address them while maybe other people think. Um, so, uh, well, actually, maybe more. Um, okay, so I see here, Farouk Hakim, hello, uh, you, you're asking me, what is the impact of Islamophobia and the double marginalization of Muslim women in the West? Um, I mean, it's a difficult, I can't sort of quantify, but the impact is big, I would say. Um, I mean, and I think that's, uh, of course, got worse after 9-11. Uh, 
um, in the US and in in uh, European countries, uh, you know, the more recent waves of terrorist attacks. Um, you know, I think France is, is a country, I mean, at some point in the UK, after we had some uh, bomb attacks there, now I think France, it's, it's Islamophobia is really quite rampant. Um, I mean, of course, we need to also be careful to not generalize Muslim women in the West, because I think that there are lots of women that you would never be able to tell whether they're Muslim or not. I mean, there are lots of women who are, uh, you know, culturally Muslim and think of themselves as Muslim, but would not be visibly Muslim. So I think that uh, women who are visibly Muslim by wearing, uh, you know, different forms of headscarf or hijab, veiling, um, are experiencing this more directly. Uh, and then I guess I would say it really depends. So I, I think in some, if you're probably in New York, it's different from being somewhere, you know, in a small place where there might be sort of more Islamophobia. I mean, certainly in the UK, there was a big difference between being in London uh, than, you know, being a, in a small town. So, yeah, there is definitely uh, an impact there, but I think we also have to be careful to not generalize Muslim women in the West in terms of the kinds of women, you know, coming different social class background. You know, if you are a refugee, that is another layer, of course, of uh, marginalization as opposed to, you know, um, educated middle class with financial means and a good job. Uh, and then also the West, uh, I think it's really as much as we need to be careful to not generalize and stereotype the Middle East, we also have to be very careful to not generalize and stereotype the West because, um, I mean, even the U.S. is not the West alone, and even within the U.S., there are big differences. Um, now, uh, then, uh, Bernard Maj uh, Majdi is asking me to talk a bit uh, about Iranian feminism. He knows an Iranian lady who went to university in the 1950s and got a BA in history. Her mother became an elementary school teacher in 1940. Her mother became a widow at 32 and raised her kids by herself through the Second World War. Yeah, I mean, um, it, okay, so I think there's a difference in uh, terms of, uh, you know, women having had access to education and being uh, working and that we see across the region. And I, I think that, you know, especially urban middle-class women, whether in Iran, Iraq, in Egypt, in Turkey, I mean, any country, you know, by the 40s, 50s, 60s, did have access to education, also higher education was working. Um, so I think that's really need to kind of move away from the idea that, uh, you know, women are just staying at home in the Middle East, but there were huge class differences. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, now, in terms of feminism, that's another story. So, you know, there has always been also an Iranian feminist movement. Uh, during the Shah's period, um, uh, the Shah did, wasn't very happy about uh, independent feminist movement, but there was some feminist activism. Of course, um, during the first years after the Islamic uh, Revolution in Iran in 1979, um, it was a bit difficult, but, you know, you've had a you know, very active Iranian feminist movement, both inside Iran and the diaspora, and they've actually, you know, have had some good uh, success in, um, for instance, I mean, in Tehran, uh, you know, feminist movement, I mean, there's, they have a magazine, they have places, uh, you know, they have NGOs still, um, women mobilized to have women only parks, which, you know, sounds like segregation, but this is actually, you know, women wanted to have a space in which they can sort of freely do sports and so, yeah, I think Iran is an interesting country where you have a very large uh, labor force participation and women are very highly, highly educated while you have a state that is, you know, trying to hold on. I mean, I think the Iranian government is divided. There are different, there are more conservative and more reformist strands. Um, okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah, thank you for your comments, Sinia Harris and Peter Makaya. Thank you. When, um, when we wait for the question, this is a time for you to indicate your reactions in the chat box. I think we have had a very good presentation, but uh, any of your comments 
uh, in which can enhance what we do in the future will be very helpful, not only with regard to this presentation, but other presentations also. Yeah. So we have time I, for a few more questions. Okay. Well, what, why people are thinking, I guess, because I'm teaching now again a class on gender and sexuality in the Middle East. And um, so I should say that, I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, which students and, but I find now that um, both at SOAS, so I, before moving to Brown to the States, I was teaching at the SOAS, which is a school of Oriental African studies, which is part of the University of London. And I definitely found a shift over the last few years. So when I started teaching, uh, you know, many years ago, um, I very much, the, the stress had to be about uh, challenging the idea of the uniform oppressed women in the Middle East. Now I feel I have to challenge quite a bit this idea of the uniform West as well. Um, and so I think that is, you know, as much as I feel that we need to challenge Orientalist depictions, but we also need to uh, challenge or Occidentalist depictions about, you know, what the West is. Um, and I'm happy to say more about that if, uh, can you, so David, Bieg asked me, could you talk a bit about the case of Morocco? They seem to be more open to a Western style. For instance, there's quite a thriving fashion industry with female models, et cetera, in Morocco. Maybe that's part of the French connection. I mean, um, I think that's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good question, but I think, again, that is more linked to the way that things get presented here, because when you think about fashion, uh, you know, everywhere in the Middle East, there's a big strand in fashion and, uh, you know, whether, I mean, I lived in Cairo for six years. I mean, um, you had side by side, I mean, you had women with mini skirts and women with more traditional clothes. I mean, Beirut, Lebanon has been called the Paris of the Middle East and largely because of the fashionable women there. Um, I think in most countries in the Middle East, again, it was very much based on class. So middle-class women, especially living in urban areas, are often dressed in a in very, I guess, fashionable Western style. Um, so, but you know, people who can't afford it, or you know, who are, um, you know, more working class, or you're know, living in rural areas, you know, might be dressing differently. Um, and, you know, but Morocco is an interesting case um, that is not, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily more open. Uh, and, you know, French colonialism had a strong reaction. You know, we have, of course, in Algeria, you had the, uh, the FLN, you have the Islamist political party, which is very much also a result of French colonialism. And in Morocco, you have a strong Islamist strand. You have the king. Uh, the Moroccan king who is trying to kind of balance on the one hand being a religious figure, but at the same time also trying to be secular and promoting women's rights. Um, but I would say things are not uh, as they seem. And if you are in Casablanca or in uh, Rabat or, you know, in any of the big cities, that's a very different scene amongst the Moroccan middle classes than when you go, you know, somewhere uh, in a village in Morocco where things can be quite um, tense and actually Morocco is one of the few countries in the Middle East where for instance have female genital mutilation amongst certain populations. Um, yes, um, okay. Any other questions? We'll wait for another 30 seconds for one or two more questions. And please continue to record your impressions and do not go away. We have two very wonderful presentations in the afternoon mm -hmm. and uh, you will not only benefit, but enjoy these presentations. And uh, we are going to break for lunch at 12.15 or earlier, depending on whether we have more questions or not. On behalf of the consortium, I would like to thank Professor Al. -Al okay, there's a question now. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I interrupt you. So, um, yeah, Carl asking me about uh, veiling, which I um, 
Yeah, I think that although I uh, tend to avoid talking about it because I think that it is a Western obsession, I think it is important to talk about it in terms of the classroom because it will come up. So thank you for the question. Um, so what should I say about veiling? I mean, the first thing that I would say is that um, we use one term uh, to mean very, very different kinds of things. So whether you use the term veil or you hijab or sometimes people use burqa, and these are very sort of actually conflating very, very different um, physical um, garments, but also politics behind it. Um, I think it is important to make a distinction between veiling that happens in places where it is um, legally required to do so. So when I think about the Middle East in Saudi Arabia or some of the Gulf countries or in Iran, women need to cover, you know, their, their hair. It's, it's a compulsory veiling. Okay. I mean, if women there would, um, and, and I would say that there is quite a large percentage of the population of women who would not do it if they were not forced to do it. At the same time, in the Middle East, you know, there are lots of women who do it on their own accord. And here, um, I would like to refer you to a study that was done at Cairo University quite a while back, maybe a decade or so, where a, a team of researchers interviewed thousands of university students about the, the, their veiling. And, you know, when I speak about veiling, you know, you had really a range of you know, women who were wearing loose garments, no makeup, and, you know, were covering their hair. Very few were covering their full face. Some women who were very, very, wearing very flimsy, uh, veiling, lots of makeup, high heels, uh, tight jeans. So, you know, there was a whole range of different veiling appearances. And as there were sort of different ways of veiling, there were also lots of different reasons why women were veiling. So, one important reason that you know many uh, women mentioned was they said well everyone does it i mean it was like you know wearing a coat i mean this is you know part of what you do uh, other women were saying well it's uh, i it's much easier for me to be able to go out and socialize since i put on the hijab because my parents give me much more freedom uh, some women were saying well it's easier to find a husband wearing hijab uh, some women said well um, I can't afford trendy, fashionable clothes and I can't go to the hairdresser. And so this is a way to look uh, respectable. Yes. And there were women who were saying, well, it is a religious prescription or others were saying it's a political statement. But what I want to stress is that there was a whole range of different reasons why women were veiling. And um, we see also, you know, I have a colleague of mine who actually looked at down veiling so that there was a time, you know, in the 90s in a place like Egypt, where more and more women were starting to wear kind of more, I guess, sort of stricter, more conservative dress code. But that has shifted. You know, this is a political as well, you know, with the, uh, I guess, disillusionment with the Muslim Brotherhood in a place like Egypt, lots of women started to, you know, actually loosen up their dress code. So um, I think it's really important to stress that, you know, veiling is that there's, first of all, I think there's too much obsession with veiling because I think that's not the main issue, of course, in those countries where women are forced to wear the veil. It is an issue, but generally speaking, it's not the main concern. And it is often done as, um, you know, out of, I mean, women's choose to, to veil and there are so many different ways to, to go about it. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, uh, I see there's a, a question by uh, Mr. Noor Islam. Yes, uh, uh, do, you con okay. do you consider, if you consider Afghanistan as a peripheral Middle Eastern country, yeah, I mean, uh, as I said uh, initially, um, I mean, it really, I mean, now lots of courses teaching on the Middle East do the greater Middle East 
do also include Central Asia and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, so, I mean, I guess I, in my classes, I haven't included teachings on Pakistan and Afghanistan, but other people do. So I think it's kind of, there's, there are different interpretations. I don't think there's a right or wrong, but I guess what I would say is if you are teaching should say some you should say you should justify why you're doing this why do you think it uh, makes sense to include those countries or not because uh, as asking this because the um, my belief and yours probably conflict always bring changes and technology yeah. sure. so in the new situation you know uh, you know the, with the new government uh, how you see it's shaping up it may go both way, I know, but uh, how you, how you... Hear. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan, but I mean, there are lots of parallels, of course, in the, in the way that um, military intervention, first of all, was used in the Afghani context and the Iraqi context. Um, but... Yeah, there are uh, some similarities. Yeah, there are some similarities, but there are also lots of differences, of course, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's uh, quite a tragedy what we see is happening in uh, Afghanistan now, uh, not just, to, you know, in terms of the Taliban and their attitudes towards women and gender, but I mean, I think it's more widespread and I mean, the reports I'm hearing about, you know, starvation and um, not access to healthcare and so on. I mean, it's a, you know, I, I think that's a lecture in and of itself and someone who is an expert on Afghanistan should probably talk about that. But I think it's a tragedy. We do the next session on Afghanistan and maybe you can raise that question at that time, sir. Mm -hmm. okay, Any you. more questions? Again, on behalf of our group and the consortium, I would like to thank Professor Al Ali. Professor Ali, I would appreciate if you can send me a link to the PowerPoints that we can share with the participants that they can use in their classroom. Uh, thank you very much. And for those of you who are participating, you have a few more minutes to record your impressions in the chat box and we will regroup at, uh, at, at 1 p.m. We have two wonderful presentations to follow, Contemporary Afghanistan and Understanding U.S.-Middle East Relations. Thank you very much. We will see you again at 1, 1 p.m. Thank you. Yeah, thank Paul, you. any other comments on your side? No, we're good. Okay, we'll see you at 1 p.m. Bye.